the topic for today's didactic is uh, food and addiction uh, now as sir has mentioned there's already there's uh, a great deal of interest that has been noted to be present in recent times about the links between food and addiction um, a lot of this although it's it's not so much a phenomenon in the developing world probably much more in the developed world where obesity is uh, a significant problem and uh, that has actually driven a lot of the uh, research that has been done in, on food and addiction in the recent past and why there is a great deal of interest in the same now uh, it's interesting to note actually that uh, that the use of addiction in the context of food is not something that has been uh, that's something very modern and uh, as far back as 1890 uh, the journal of inebriety which was one of the first journals uh, in the relation in relation to addiction actually uh, referred to the term addiction as opposed to other terms like alcoholism or dipsomania uh, for the first time in reference to chocolate uh, which was as far back as 1890 and uh, way back in the 1950s uh, randolph uh, in a seminal paper had actually talked about food addiction which he defined as a specific adaptation to one or more regularly consumed foods to which a person is highly sensitive uh, producing a common pattern of symptoms which are descriptively similar to those of other addictive processes he purported that uh, addictive consumption of corn wheat coffee milk eggs and potatoes were reported uh now apart from coffee none of these have actually made the transition i mean into the realm of addiction as of now but uh, again in the last 15 to 20 years there has been a significant amount of resurgence of interest in trying to find out whether there are specific foods uh, or whether food per se can uh, lead to uh, an addictive spectrum uh, condition so uh, in relevance to this there are a few questions that i would like to answer in this presentation uh now are foods inherently rewarding and reinforcing so and if so what are the mechanisms for the same uh can certain foods be deemed to be addictive uh can obesity per se be understood based on an addictive model and is food addiction as such a valid concept so uh let's start off with how the brain reacts to food now uh like like uh food is essentially what is called a natural reward and uh, there are homeostatic and hedonic components to food consumption now the homeostatic component of food consumption is essentially governed by signatures which are signals which are related to stores of energy and energy demands which are there in the body but food as we all know and experience also has a hedonic component to it which is uh, consumption which is motivated by uh, the reward system so uh, uh the interesting thing about this is that earlier it was thought that these two kind of uh, systems were uh, mutually exclusive but over a period of time we found that they are actually fairly interlinked and both of them respond to metabolic sig uh, signaling which is there from the peripheral organs so when you're talking about how the brain reacts to food uh, obviously the first thing that one talks about when talking about reward pathways is that uh, of dopamine signaling now uh, natural rewards just like chemical rewards which are there for any other substances also stimulate the reward pathway and uh, there is a surge of dopamine that is noted to be present whenever a person has an intake of palatable food quite similar to how there is a surge of dopamine which is there subsequent to uh, an intake of a chemical substance now the difference that is generally seen between chemical substances and food is uh, that the habituation that takes place to uh, the the dopamine response with food uh, is seen to normalize over a period of time and as a result of that there is a less tendency or at least that was what was purported for food to actually become addictive in the way that chemical substances would now essentially what is seen is that when there is a transition from uh from uh, the initial phase of use and pleasure or uh, hedonicity that is seen associated with dopamine signaling and uh, uh and the shift towards addiction it's essentially when there is uh, a a transition from just the mere rewards that are there from the primary substances uh to uh, rewards that are uh, that are elicited merely by cues that predict the availability of the rewards 
So this is actually mediated by a transition of dopaminergic activity from the ventral striatum to the dorsal striatum. So essentially, from the impulsive or the pleasurable components, you switch to a more compulsive component, which is what is the trademark of addiction. Now, the question is, with food, actually, whatever research that has been done up till now has not, has not shown sufficient evidence to suggest the same in this. Now, another, uh, uh, another uh, group of, uh, of endogenous chemicals which are frequently associated with the brain's reaction to food is that of the opioids or the endogenous opioids. Now, uh, it has been noticed that opioids cause an increased desire for palatable foods. And uh, it has also been noticed that especially foods that are already pref preferred tend to be reinforced further. So uh, the opioid signaling might have a role as far as reinforcing already established hedonic value. So things that one likes already, things which are preferred and pleasurable will get reinforced by the opioid, uh, uh, by the opioid uh, network. Now there are certain hedonic hotspots where there is an increased amount of opioid signaling. Again, this is linked to the dopaminergic system, uh, particularly in the medial shell of the nucleus accumbens as well as the ventral palate. Now, I was talking about some metabolic signals. So, uh, hormones like leptin, which are uh, uh, found in the adipose tissue as well as ghrelin, which is released in response to food, uh, uh, food consumption from the gastrointestinal tract. They have been known to, for many years to be primary regulators of homeostatic food consumption. But uh, of late, we have also noticed that through their actions on ventrotegmental uh, area dopamine, they can also affect the hedonic drive for food. And so it is not only, uh, so the food, uh, the drive for food is not uh, merely to seek pleasure, but uh, also the homeostatic uh, mechanisms of food can also affect the pleasurable uh, uh, intake of food. So, as I've mentioned, this is what summarizes it. Similar to drugs, food can also affect uh, the reward cir circuitry, but the pathways to it are quite different. Now, uh, to answer the second question that uh, we had raised, are certain foods addictive? Now, intuitively speaking, uh, a lot of people report that there are certain kinds of food which people find to be extremely addictive. And they say that there are people who are chocoholics and people who like particular types of fast food and junk food. Now, as far as research into this, there are a few difficulties as far as trying to quantify this. The main problem, especially in humans, is that uh, there is no single, uh, I mean, micronutrient or macronutrient that, uh, that food is restricted to in our diet. I mean, so it's while in experimental uh, uh, paradigms, so for example, in animal studies, it would be possible to have specific sugar diets or specific fat diets. It's much more difficult to translate that into humans. So what has been noticed is that high sugar and high fat combinations or what are called cafeteria diets. So these are essentially diets like what people generally get in cafeterias and fast food restaurants, which would be burgers, pizzas, uh, uh, chocolates, which are a combination of high carbohydrates as well as fats, do tend to have rewarding and reinforcing properties. And this has been noticed both in animal as well as in human studies. Uh, so as I've mentioned, the problem is since there isn't uh, a single micronutrient that we can study, uh, it would be very difficult to say that under normal physiological circumstances, human, human beings cra crave specific foods so that they're in ingesting a specific substance in that food. Now, the other interesting thing about uh, the link between food and addiction, of course, has got to do with the fact is that two people with addiction also have uh, preferences for certain types of food. Now, there have been some anecdotal studies which have been done in people who are recovering addicts, but especially in people who are recovering from uh, alcohol addiction and nicotine addiction, where uh, there has been noticed to be an increased amount of use of carbohydrate rich foods as well as fat rich foods. So that could again lead to a putative link between, uh, between food and addiction. Now, uh, bringing all of this together, uh, there has been in the last five or six years, an increasing amount of work that has tried to look at obesity, uh, which is of course now becoming a significant public health problem since there has been an increasing uh, prevalence of obesity that has been noted across the world, particularly in the developing world. Uh, and there has been a need for trying to find new ways for treating obesity because whatever measures that have been used up till now have been found to be insufficient. 
So it is in this regard where people have been trying to look at obesity from the model of addiction. And uh, the reasons for this are as follows. And so the main amount of work that has been done can be classified under these five headings. One is, of course, the clinical overlap between uh, obesity and addiction. Uh, second is a shared vulnerability to both ob obesity and substance addiction. Uh, the third is tolerance, withdrawal, and compulsive food seek seeking in animal models. So basically, uh, basically evidence from animal models is the uh, third uh, group of, of evidences. Also, evidences from uh, imaging studies, which include uh, uh, pet imaging studies as well as functional imaging studies, uh, which have looked at obese, uh, uh, which have looked at obese humans, and they have tried to compare them with models of addiction. So. I will be talking about each of these five subheadings and we will try to see whether obesity can be compared with addiction in each of these five domains. So as far as uh, clinical overlap is concerned, uh, now we have the DSM-IV criteria for substance dependence and uh, clinical research has been geared based on these criteria for substance dependence as far as uh, obesity and food addiction are also concerned. Now, uh, the problem that we have while looking at a clinical phenotype for, uh, for uh, food addiction or for that matter for uh, an equivalent of substance dependence in obesity is the fact that the clinical population is very, very heterogeneous. Now, uh, we are looking, uh, most studies have looked at people with obesity in general. So that is people with a high BMI. They have also looked at people with aberrant patterns of food uh, intake. So this, this would include people like uh, with binge eating disorder, people with other eating disorders. And then they've also tried to look at an independent uh, kind of entity, which is being tried to trying to be developed, which is that of food addiction. Now, uh, when you look at each of the criteria of DSM-4 for substance dependence and try to compare it with food addiction or with people with obesity, so tolerance essentially uh, uh, implies increasing amounts of drugs are required to reach intoxication. Now, uh, uh, equivalently for food, uh, one would require increased amounts of food which are required to reach satiety. Now, the, the, the criticism of this is the fact that uh, uh, one cannot assume an equivalence between satiety and intoxication. Now, essentially in people who have binge eating or excessive uh, intake of food, uh, uh, the people who actually eat excessively, uh, they eat in the absence of hunger and they eat to the point of physical dis discomfort, which is actually beyond the point of satiety. So you're actually not in, uh, the, although the amounts of food are increasing, uh, the neurobiological equivalent, which would be that increasing amounts of food to reach satiety would not actually be uh, fulfilled in this kind of a uh, paradigm. So as a result of that, tolerance may or may not be present in food addiction. Uh, the second thing is withdrawal symptoms on drug discontinuation or distress and dysphoria during dieting. Now, uh, as of now, there has been no convincing evidence of a human withdrawal symptom for foods that has been noted to be present. As far as craving, uh, which is a persistent desire for food and unsuccessful attempts to curtail the amount of food eaten, uh, this there has been some evidence that there may be uh, clinical uh, clinical uh, evidence even in food addiction, but uh, there need to be both severity and impairment thresholds. And uh, similarly for uh, uh, measures like loss of control, salience, as well as use despite harmful consequences, which have a slightly better translation from substance dependence to food addiction. So as far as the clinical overlap is concerned, uh, there is some amount of convergence that is there between substance dependence criteria as well as food addiction. Although this may not be translated to the broad phenotype of obesity, as I will mention later in my presentation. Now, as far as shared vulnerability is concerned, uh, this looks at family studies uh, of people with substance dependence, and there has been noted to be an increased risk of obesity in this population. Similarly, people with binge eating disorders are also associated with increased levels of substance use disorders in their relatives, which again might point towards the fact that there may be some shared vulnerability. Uh, at a genetic level, there has also been noted to be uh, certain, uh, certain genetic uh, variants. So the TAC1A minor allele of the dopamine receptor or the DRD2 gene has been associated with substance use disorders as well as with obesity. And uh, similarly, 
in obese individuals with binge eating disorder, uh, there is a higher prevalence of uh, a gain of function allele of the opioid receptor. And that is associated with an increased sensitivity to re uh, reward, as well as greater preference for sweet and fatty food, as well as substance addiction. So uh, there do seem to be some shared vulnerability that is noted to be present between both addiction to food or in people with obesity specifically, as well as uh, with substance addiction and substance dependence. Now, as far as animal models are concerned, when you're talking about animal models of addiction, essentially we try to study three things. We try to study uh, for the presence of tolerance. Uh, we look for the presence of physical dependence as well as the emergence of a withdrawal symptom. Now, uh, as far as food addiction is concerned and uh, in the study of obesity as an addictive disease, uh, there have been three models that have been studied. One is a pure sugar binging model, wherein uh, there is limitation of food intake for 12 hours. Uh, this is uh, These models are in rodents. So there is limitation of uh, food intake for 12 hours, followed by a 12 hour period where a person is given varying concentrated solutions of glucose, sucrose or saccharin. And what has been noticed is that in self-administration models, there has been some mimicking of addiction-like phenotype, wherein the person tends to use larger and larger amounts of sugar as time, time goes on during the same amount of time. So uh, the interesting fact is, although there is development of tolerance uh, and also there is withdrawal. So when there is, uh, abs when the when the rat models who are addicted to these, uh, to the to the sugar solutions are withheld from the sugar solutions, they tend to develop uh, signs of distress and withdrawal, which are seen in animal models. Uh, they do not, however, induce obesity. Uh, the fact is that, uh, and similar findings to this have also been noticed in fat binging models. Now, there have been correlates of this that have been noticed neurobiologically as well. So similarly, uh, there has been noticed to be an increased release of dopamine when there is development of tolerance noted to be present in the dopaminergic uh, pathways of the brain. And there has been noticed to be a decrease in dopamine that has been present in withdrawal. So both of these are seen in the sugar binging as well as in the fat binging models in rodents. Uh, what has been noticed, however, is that in the sweet fat model, wherein what we are talking about cafeteria diets, which are probably more applicable to human models as well. Uh, they actually induce obesity, but they do not actually develop a typical addiction phenotype, wherein uh, the presence of sweet and fat don't actually cause withdrawal symptoms the way that a pure sugar or a pure fat, fat model in animals have been noted, noted to do. Uh, the next level of evidence that I was going to uh, talk to you about is uh, that from uh, imaging studies. So that is both studies that have looked at uh, at uh, dopamine binding in various parts of the of the brain through positron positron emission tomography studies, as well as functional imaging studies. So uh, in studies which have looked at uh, PET studies which have looked at dopamine receptor binding, this was a seminal study that was done in two thousand and one where uh, uh, Wang and Volkov have actually found that in obese individuals, uh, there are actually lower uh, dopamine recept striatal dopamine receptors that have been noted to be present, although it was quite a, a small sample size that was taken. So this was quite a revolutionary finding because uh, a reward hypofunction or a decrease in dopamine is something that is uh, seen to be present in people or or purported to be present in people with addiction, which is the reason why they need uh, uh, external reward to increase the uh, striatal dopamine noted to be present. Now, uh, so this was actually something that people thought would be a significant link between obesity and addiction. However, what has been found is that in subsequent uh, studies, in obese, uh, obese subjects, uh, there have been inconsistent results regarding uh, dopamine receptor bindings with no differences noted to be present with healthy controls and uh, there is not noted to be a graded increase that is noted to be present with BMI. Uh, apart from that, another group of PET studies has looked at involving dopamine stimulating drugs along with food related uh, stimuli. So essentially uh, to see whether the effect of dopamine is more prominent, you give a dopamine releasing drug like methylphenidate and simultaneously produce, uh, give the uh, uh, present food related stimuli to these obese subjects. Now, uh, and then look for whether there is uh, an appropriate increase in striatal dopamine that is noted to be present. Uh, 
Now, uh, there have been mixed findings related to both of these uh, in both healthy as well as obese subjects. And so, as far as that is concerned, the, uh, the relationship between obesity and addiction uh, now is probably not as promising as it was in the initial, initial phase noted. Uh, as far as functional imaging is concerned, uh, functional imaging has looked at three different kinds of, uh, uh, of functional imaging studies uh, and uh, their association with the reward circuitry. One is, of course, uh, functional imaging with uh, a presentation of food imaging. Uh, the other is uh, uh, imaging where there is a presentation of, uh, of cues which, uh, which signal presentation of food or reward. That is the anticipation of reward. And unlike in uh, substance use studies where we cannot actually study the response to the consumption of the reward or that might be considered unethical, in uh, people with food addiction, one can also actually give the person food and try to see what the person's response to uh, 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 to food in functional imaging would be noted to be noted to be. So, uh, what has been actually noted to be present, although the the findings of these studies, as you will as you will notice, have been ambivalent, uh, is that there is noted to be an increased anticipation for food cues that has been noted to be present in obese people. So, this is uh, characterized by an increased dopaminergic uh, 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 signaling in the striatum that has been noted to be present. And after uh, consuming the reward, there has been noted to be a decreased dopaminergic uh, signaling that has been present in the striatum. So, essentially what this means is that the person anticipates rewards from food more than usual or like as compared to healthy controls, people who are obese, they will anticipate they will they will have more activation of certain brain areas or a more dopamine release in uh, in response to anticipation of food reward but when they actually get the food there isn't an adequate amount of reward that is noted to be present so the dopamine release is not adequate and so they tend to eat more food to actually get the adequate amount of reward so this does point to the fact that there might be uh, some links between obesity and addiction because this is very similar to the kind of picture that is seen in people with addiction wherein there is a great anticipation for uh, uh, drug related cues but not an adequate uh, 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 I mean uh, they don't uh, in uh, following presentation of the drug there isn't an adequate uh, 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 this thing of the of the cues so, so uh, when you're talking about a model for obesity uh, what one needs to look at is that food addiction uh, may not be uh, the single uh, explanatory model for obesity. As we are aware, there are individual predispositions, there are problems with appetite and satiety, there is the food environment and the energy expenditure itself, as well as physical environment and env environmental influences, which uh, play a role in energy imbalance. Whereas personality and reward circuitry in the form of reward sensitivity, impulsivity and food addiction would be one part of uh, the development of obesity. Now, uh, moving on to the final question that we're going to talk about uh, is that, is there an independent entity called food addiction? Now, we've talked about how addiction relates to obesity and abnormal food patterns. But is there anything called food addiction which exists independent from obesity, independent from binge eating disorder, and may be present even in normal individuals? Now, uh, there is something called the Yale Food Addiction Scale, which has been based on dsm 4 criteria for substance dependence, uh, which has looked at uh, the presence of addictive eating behavior. And it has been validated in a variety of populations, including obese populations, as well as clinical populations seeking treatment for weight loss, as well as underweight, normal weight, and overweight uh, people. Now, what has been noted to be present is, that there have been rates of food addiction of about 1.6% uh, even in normal weight population, whereas uh, there has been an, uh, uh, rates of food addiction of up to 7.7% 7 .7 in overweight or ob obese population. So food addiction is not limited only to people who are obese, but they may be present even in people with, uh, with normal weight that may be noted to be present. Now, uh, as far as uh, um, the clinical implications of this, what it means is that when people seek treatment for, uh, uh, for being overweight or, uh, or obese, as much as 19% of them might meet criteria for food, food addiction. They also uh, display symptoms of substance dependence, higher scores of binge eating and emotional eating. Uh, 
as well as a presence of higher levels of depression and anxiety which again is a parallel with people with substance dependence who do tend to have a higher comorbidity of uh, depression and anxiety and also they have decreased weight loss following weight, weight loss programs uh, similarly again uh, there have been higher levels of negative effect and emotional dysregulation in obese treatment seeking uh, uh, adults who have fulfilled the criteria for food addiction now uh, the final thing that i'd like to talk about as far as food addiction is concerned where we're talking about the construct of food addiction itself is the neural correlates of food addiction wherein we take this scale which is the yale food addiction scale and see if a severity a high severity on the food addiction scale actually correlates with any sort of neural changes which have been uh, purported to be present in addiction and uh, this study this which, which was done in 2011 has actually found that there has been greater activation in the dlpfc as well as the caudate in response to anticipated receipt of food but less activation in inhibitory areas like the orbitofrontal cortex in response to receipt of food and this has been positively correlated with higher food addiction scores on the yale food addiction scale uh, so this is quite similar to patterns of neural addiction that have been noted in in substance dependence as well and uh, so this might might actually uh, uh, indicate the fact that food addiction might uh, have some parallels with substance addiction and might require further evaluation for the same now uh, to answer each of the questions the conclusions that we could reach are that food definitely has potential for producing rewarding and reinforcing effects it's a natural uh, reward after all and uh, so it is similar in some ways to drugs of abuse evidence for specific foods being addictive remains limited however uh, also understanding obesity from a purely addiction model may be reductive although there requires to be more work that needs to be done in terms of finding uh, uh, ways in which we can treat obesity using the addiction model uh, as far as the evidence uh, towards the existing uh, existence of food addiction is concerned uh, there is some evidence that points towards the same but there is more study which is required to validate the concept as far as future directions in defining food addiction per se is concerned we need to have more precise neuro behavioral definitions of food addiction uh, which are specific to food addiction itself uh, incorporating impulsivity compulsivity and other markers of vulnerability might uh, serve to improve uh, understanding of this form of addiction uh, apart from that uh, applying current models of addiction that are based on neuroscientific work for example trying to demonstrate a transition from goal directed food seeking under voluntary control to compulsive habitual seeking which is quite similar to addiction uh, might be something that may be useful in research on food addiction as well as uh, relating more precise behavioral and cognitive phenotypes rather than things like bmi which have been what have been the basis for studying food addiction up till now might serve as a better way of delineating food addiction as an individual and specific phenotype